Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, privacy issues are, I think, probably near and dear to everybody's hearts here. Um, I'm going to share a little story with you. So, a couple, so, okay. My daughter has been obsessed with Lady Gaga <laughs> ever since she saw the, the, uh, the show at the Super Bowl. Um, I must admit, Lady Gaga's performance was absolutely incredible. Um, but we have watched it uh, probably seven times a day since the Super Bowl. Thank you. She's two and a half and has endeavored to really um, learn every word and dance move that, that uh, she sees on TV. So literally, I, I need to impress upon you, every single day of mine starts, I wake up because Lady Gaga is on TV and she's trying to dance and sing. Okay, so... Last week, she comes up to me while I'm sleeping, starts tapping me on the head. She's, she's two, two and a half. Um, and she had just watched the part where Lady Gaga is about to jump off of the roof. And right before that, Lady Gaga says, One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Daddy, what's liberty? What does liberty mean? So explaining the concept of, of liberty... Um, at 7 in the morning, right when you wake up, to a girl that's knocking on your head is not easy. And um, I turned over and tried to shy away from it, but she kept persisting. And eventually I just said to her, do you like reading books? She said, yeah. I said, what if I told you you could only read your, your Dr. Seuss books? And not knowing, I was trying to make a point. She said, no! I said, okay, okay, yeah. Um, do you like going to school and playing with your friends? Yes. What if I told you that you couldn't play with all of your friends, you can only play with certain friends? No! Okay, we'll talk about this, this later. Please go, go dance. But that's a fundamental concept here, what liberty is. Liberty is the ability to read what you want, when you want, to watch the documentaries and the movies that you want without having to feel like you need to answer to somebody for it, to pursue your passions and, your, and explore your creativity, without somehow getting in trouble for it. And a fundamental concept, too, along with that, is that in the, the United States, what makes this country so incredible, is that we have access to so many different outlets and, and so many different sources of media and so, many, and so much content it's not sorted for us. We get to go and find the information that we want to learn about. And that's part of the joy of, of being in this country is to seek out our passions and to pursue them. Okay. What does that have to do with privacy? I, I get it. Um, here's the thing. We all know that we have constitutional protections, that we are free to buy and watch the movies and the books that we want to. We're free to associate with whoever we want to. We're free to organize on Tuesday nights and demand better access to, to government uh, documents that actually belong in the public space and better access to, to them. Um, and, and, and that's great. And the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment prevents well, it's supposed to stop cops and the, and the government from knocking on our door and busting in at night or at four in the morning to see what's on our shelves, to see who we're talking to, to see who we have over. But something that a lot of people don't consider is that the Fourth Amendment only applies to the government and to police officers. Companies are not required and, and don't give people the same protections that the Constitution requires that government gives us. And that's a big thing. It's a big thing when it comes to liberty. Because while the government might not be the one that's spying on us, there are plenty of people that are and are actually exploiting us and our information and our habits and behaviors in ways 
that not even the government could, could imagine. And I'm not talking about all companies. I love, I love technology. <laughs> but there, there, are, there are some, and, and there's more than, than you would think. Um, we're, we're living in an age now where everything that we do is recorded. Um, you walk out of your house, you walk past your nest, your nest knows that you're now not home. It's recorded. You carry your smartphone around all day. Your smartphone is a quest- questionnaire that you are constantly filling out and that is constantly providing somebody insight into who you are as a person. Your smartphone tracks you throughout the day, where you go, to the gym, to the doctor, to school, uh, to, drop your, to drop your kids off at school. Um, the problem is, is that people don't know it, and even if they did, what are they going to do about it? So, dealing with the first, first question first, um, people don't, or the first issue first, people don't know what's going on. So, I, I work at a law firm called Edelson PC. Um, we basically make it our job to figure out what the heck is going on out there. Um, we're living in an age of interconnected devices, and every device is sending off signals to somebody. Um, when you connect to an app, there are dozens of analytics companies that just tapped into your phone and that's recording and transmitting everything that's going on. Um, it's, it's a mess. We're just trying to make some, some sense of it. So I think we have a lot of fun um, at our office. We, we set up a, uh, an Internet of Things exploitation lab. This, I just snapped a quick picture uh, from when we were testing the Hello Barbie doll. Um, what's going on with, with Hello Barbie, like a lot of kids' toys, is that it's recording, uh, it's recording audio without people, without people knowing it. And it's trans, you know, it, we're testing now to see where it transmits to and under what circumstances. Um, but uh, that's a big issue when your kids are, ha- are, are hanging out with toys and talking. And without you knowing it, everything that's in earshot of a Barbie doll is being, is being recorded and potentially transmitted back to, to the company. It can be, it, there are some that only record and store locally, but... But there are also some that transmit back to the companies. Um, some more of what we do is we monitor web traffic um, and see uh, which websites, which apps are sending data where and which apps are allowing different companies and analytics companies into your phone without, without ever mentioning it to the, to the user. I mean, even if you were to read through the privacy policies, these are things that they don't say, that they don't talk about for good reason, because somebody would, n- would notice it and point it out, and it would be a big thing. People would be less likely to use the app if they were conscious about their privacy. Um, we also, uh, a little unre- unrelated, but we are constantly testing different types of websites for vulnerabilities. Um, right now, we're on this big kick with uh, medical payment portals. Um, pff, you'd be shocked by how vulnerable information is uh, that is submitted through, through those portals. Um, so t- to give you just a quick uh, sense of kind of what, what we do, I, just, I did this before I came here. I just went to a website, a, a news website. I mean, you know, look, th- there are certain types of information that companies love to have about you. Because certain types of information give great insight into your soul and, and who you are as a person. Um, the types of movies that you walk, that, that you watch, types of books that you read, speak to who, who you are as a person. I, I mean, right now there are, in custody cases across the country, the... Uh, the, the movie histories of people are being introduced to try to make a case for why somebody has a propensity for violence or, for, you know, or is more dangerous than, than somebody else. You can get real data points from, these types of, uh, from that type of media. Uh, and another type of media that is increasingly becoming more and more relevant is news. 
and the type of news that you consume and that you view and the types of uh, news sources that you go to. So here's just a, a, qu a quick example. I went to CNBC. I'm not trying to pick on CNBC. Um, and I just I watched this video about tax season. Okay, so nothing else was open on my computer. Nothing else was open, including Facebook. But if you look at the web traffic, the video ID, along with my Facebook user uh, number, was sent to Facebook. That I don't know if that surprises people or not, but but that happens literally with every website that that you go to. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, I went to TV Guide, and I was I watched. A Game of Thrones, uh, a, a video about how Jon Snow might return. We all know how he did. Um, <laughs> but again, nothing open on my, nothing else open on my computer. You've got TV Guide sending that video to Facebook, and again with, with my Facebook ID. So people are collecting this data and they're analyzing it and making a lot of money. Uh, with with your data and m making money in ways that that you might not even consider, which is the the, the scary thing. Um, there are major data mining companies, Axiom and Experian, um, and more. Last year, the data mining industry generated two hundred billion dollars with a B off of selling and trading personal information. When you go to buy insurance, uh, the carrier will pull your profile from Axiom and try to assess your, your, riskiness, your uh, riskiness level. And you don't have to take my word for, for this. The Obama administration did an um, investigation in 2012 and found conclusively that if you subscribe to a motorcycle magazine, at some point in your life, and then you go to buy insurance, your premiums will be higher if you even get the insurance. Your insurance will be higher than somebody comparative that did not subscribe to a motorcycle magazine. Every magazine publisher sells your subscription histories to Axiom, to these data miners. It's not a secret anymore. Um, I mean, they might be making more off of that sale than, than actually selling the subscriptions to consumers. You'll notice, you'll think back about it now, and remember how often you're, you're offered free magazine subscriptions everywhere. It's not because they want auto, to auto-bill you the following year when you forget to, to cancel. It's because that data actually means something to a lot of people. Uh, the Obama administration also found that um, banks were using this type of data to consider who to, who to lend to. There's a new credit score that's being built off of Facebook posts that banks are using to determine your credit worthiness. Um, it's, it's the Wild West out there. Uh, it, you know, they're, look, after the election, a lot was made about a Muslim registry. Um, there was a lot of concern, and rightly so, that the government was going to build a, a, Muslim, a Muslim registry and that that was going to become a big issue, a, a civil rights issue. It still is. But the thing is, is that the Muslim registry has already been built by these data miners, and you can actually buy it. Anybody can buy it. I'll just prove it to you real quick. I'm not trying to pick on exact data because, because this is not, not illegal and, and everybody's doing it. But I'll just take you through very quickly. Um, you go to the, to the website. Who do you want to target? You get the, you say addresses. Um, you can pick your region. I picked Illinois. Then religion. You can, you can narrow this down based on any religion, right? So, boom. So there were 81,417 addresses for people in this database. And guess what? 
You don't even need to be a company. That's not one of the red starred fields. You don't even need to be a company to buy this. This data, it, it cost, uh, I, I think, to get $81,000, $6,000, okay? So the, the government can access this data. They can buy it just like anybody else. This data collection, th these efforts by these companies, it, the, the fear is ultimately that it's going to be a workaround to get beyond the Fourth Amendment. If the, de if the government is not collecting this information and somebody else is and the government just buys it, then it's publicly available and there's no reasonable um, feeling of security or, or privacy in, in that data. I fear that that's, what the, that, that's the next argument that's going to be made. Um, has anybody heard of Cam Cambridge Analytica? Cambridge Analytica is a big deal. It's, it's credited for winning Trump the election. And what Cambridge Analytica did was informed Trump about how to spend his ad dollars, how and where to spend his ad dollars, and how to target his message to certain groups of people. And I'm not talking about groups like, like, like Jews or uh, blue-collar workers. Or, or, or Hindus in this space? No. He, he got granular street by street with Cambridge Analytica. You can target certain households. You can push messages out to certain households. So, so and the, the whole thing is based upon this idea that based upon all the data that they, that they can aggregate, all the transactions, you go to Target, you go to Best Buy, you go to the gas station, you go to a restaurant, um, you, you know, all of, the, all of the transactional data that you generate on a daily basis and all of the apps that are working on your phone and all the, all the data that they're taking um, and all of your Facebook posts and your likes, you, and you crunch all those numbers. So Cambridge Analytica says that they have 5,000 data points on every single person in the country. Just, just, just think about that. What they can do with this data is figure out whether you enjoy new experiences, whether you prefer plans in order, whether you like spending time with others, whether you put people's needs before yours, and whether you tend to worry a lot. This is, this is a, personal, a personality model called Ocean. Um, and using Ocean, Trump literally tailored his message to different groups of people. I'm, I'm just going just gonna to read you a quick... Um, statement from Cambridge Analytica's uh, CEO. And by the way, who's on the board of Cambridge Analytica? Steve Bannon. But this is from the um, CEO of Cambridge Analytica. Psychographically categorized voters can be differently addressed based on, for example, gun rights, the Second Amendment. Okay, here, here we go. For a highly neurotic and conscientious audience, the threat of burglary, and the insurance policy of a gun. And the image that they show is the hand of an intruder smashing through a window. For a closed and agreeable audience, people who care about tradition and habits and family, the message that they see is a man and a child standing in a field at sunset, both holding guns, shooting ducks. These it's, it's funny, but these ads are tailored to actually people. Not, not every, it's, they're not, it's not a message that he is disseminating to the world because it's his message. It's your message. It's our message. They are tailoring these ads to people. Um, and it's, it's horrifying. Um, I mean, the rumor on the street is that Bruce Rauner just retained Cambridge Analytica, who, by the way, has now pledged to only, wor to only work with Republicans going forward. So... I heard that after, like, 100 impressions on this, that the, the software program knows you better than, than you do. 100%. 100%. Because just think about that. You, you might not want to admit all the things that you know about yourself, right? 
you you look past some things. You think that, you know, my wife says I communicate horribly, so I'm really sorry for everybody sitting here today. But <laughs> she um, she she tells me that I need to express myself better, and I say I, I'm expressing myself. Okay, Cambridge Analytica actually assigns a score to how well you express your yourself. It's a it's an entire comprehensive personality test um, that you don't know is actually being conducted. You're, uh, you're a patient in an experiment, and you don't know it, but the results are used against you. Yep. Some of those um, free Facebook personality tests that you mentioned oh, yeah. are actually Cambridge Analytica tests. Right? So, yeah. You don't even know when you click the, you know, by agreeing to this, right. whatever, they, right. they do a personality test. So some of you probably saw personality tests for which Star Trek uh, which Star Trek ca ca character are you? Right, some head shaking. Or oth others might have seen which Game of Thrones character are you? Or which Star Wars character are you? <laughs> the other brilliant thing about it is that they actually tailor the tests to people specifically. So not, not everybody sees the Game of Thrones test. You see the Game of Thrones test if you're most likely to respond to it, if they think that you're going to respond to it. Um, so where does this all leave us with privacy and the law? So it leaves us in the beginning because right now there is, in the United States, there is no privacy framework. There's no comprehensive set of laws that, apply to, that, uh, that dictate what companies can and cannot do with respect to your privacy and your personal information. Things, when things come up, the government deals with it. So to give you a quick example, uh, in 1988, there was a very contentious Supreme Court hearing, uh, a very contentious Supreme Court no nomination hearing. Joe Biden was grilling um, a uh, potential judge, a judge that, that was nominated to the su Supreme Court for three days. And it was... It was, I've seen videos, um, I've, I've read the, the articles, it was a, po a polarized atmosphere in Washington, just, just as it is now. And what happened was before the third day, a reporter went to the judge's uh, local video store and got a hold of a subscription, or a, uh, a rental list. All the movies that this, that this guy rented from this movie store he got, he got a hold of. Okay, so thank God for this guy that there was nothing bad, that, that bad in there. The story that ran the next day was learn about the inner workings of Judge Bork's mind. And it was all about the documentaries that he was watching were too conservative, et, et cetera. But the hilarious thing about that is that all of the uh, Republicans and Democrats on the Hill figured out for the first time that their video records could be accessed from any, from any video store. And in an incredibly bipartisan effort, they quickly passed the Video Privacy Protection Act, which I think was the last privacy, uh, was the last federal piece of privacy legislation to actually get enacted. So things happen on a very sectoral basis. Um, it, nothing's gonna happen at the federal level. Uh, going forward. But at the state level, I mean, the ACLU in 2008 was instrumental in bringing an issue to the, le the legislature's attention. There was a fingerprinting company, if you were, were hiring employees and you wanted to fingerprint them. There was a, finger, a fingerprinting company that, that took care of all that, that had records on millions of Illinois residents um, that had applied to jobs that they were, uh, that this company was hired to, you know, fi fingerprint them for. Um, and then, inevitably, the company filed for bankruptcy and the trustee was selling off all the assets. Well, your finger, the fingerprints of millions of Illinois residents was the most valuable asset that they owned. The ACLU stepped in right before this, the, there was going to be a sale and the, the legislature stepped up and passed the Illinois Biometric Information Pr Privacy Act which protects your fingerprints, your face scans, retina scans, your voice. Um, so that's great, but like I said, it's on a case-by-case, case, nobody 
acts until things are dire and until right before um, an issue could potentially really harm a lot, a lot of people. And especially now in the days where every other week you're hearing about a data breach where, you know, billions of people's information was released. You just kind of think about that in terms of all this data that people are aggregating about us. If somebody stole your biometric face print, I I mean, if they steal your credit card, you just get a new credit card number, right? What, What do you do if they steal your biometric face print? You get a new nose? Because in a couple years... All the authentication is going to be biometric. You're, you're going to be logging into apps, your, your banking apps especially, with, with, a, with a selfie. Um, so, okay, to, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm going over. To, uh, to kind of get to the point here. Um, there is an incredible opportunity right now in Springfield. Uh, I mean... I think the state is one of the best states in the country to be in, to practice as a lawyer in, to be a technologist in, and to be a consumer in, because the legislature actually cares. And the legislature wants to hear from technologists about these issues. Um, They created a whole committee in the House called Cybersecurity, Data Analytics, and Information Technology. It's the first committee in the country that's dedicated to investigating and learning about these privacy issues and these collection and disclosure issues. Um, So right now, there's an immediate need for people to share their expertise um, with with lawmakers. And, And specifically, there's been three bills that were introduced by really sophisticated uh, representatives and senators. One says that um, it's a geolocation bill that says that you cannot collect geolocation information from somebody's phone without their consent. That, I don't know. Seems pretty common sense. There's one that says that you cannot access the microphone on a person's device. You can't turn it on without their consent. And consent is just telling them that you're doing it and then pressing a button. And then there's a a bill that would allow consumers to ask companies that they give their information to who those companies are selling their personal information to. Um, If anybody's interested in learning more about how to get involved in Springfield, please come talk to me after. I'm I'm, going to hang out for a couple hours. Um, There's a lot of very interesting opportunities to even sit down on, on a one, one-on-one basis with a lot of these lawmakers and explain things to them in ways that they are not getting right now. Because in Springfield, there are lobbyists. And if you have a lobbyist because you're a special interest group or you're a company, then you have access. And I'm not, not I'm, I'm making a generalization, but they want to hear from you. They want to hear from people that are actually in the know on how this stuff works. Um, Actually, tomorrow, there is a hearing downtown at the Bolandic building. Uh, I think it's on LaSalle. Um, It's going to be the first hearing on uh, for the Cybersecurity Data Analytics and IT Committee, and the subject matter is privacy and transparency implications of new and emerging surveillance and data collections technologies going to be a super interesting uh, hearing. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Alvaro Bedoya from the Georgetown Center for Law and Technology, but he's coming in to testify. Um, There are some technologists that will be testifying. I think the Attorney General and the Sheriff's Department will be testifying. So um, if you can make it, it's open to the public. It will also be webcast live. Um, and if you're, and we just don't have the link yet, but I'm happy to circulate it to anybody that's interested in, in tuning in. Thank you for, for having me. So if Illinois enacts some of these laws that would grant a lot of privacy and protection to citizens, what does that do for like a national scale, like for something like Google or something that's you know, that big, is that going to, you know, change their, 
you know, distribution of their software in Illinois, or is, is, is that the hope, or is that the, that they would do it nationally? Um, that, so, it's okay. So the basis of every privacy law is transparency. If you get consent, or you, you know, put people on notice, and you're on the same page as to what's happening, then um, you're, you're good. Google, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> Go companies like Google, um, are sophisticated in this space. And um, to the extent that they're tracking your geolocation information and they're not already getting your permission to do it, yeah, they'll, they'll need to add something to their terms or they'll need to make it clear that when you use a certain app, your GPS coordinates are being uploaded you know, to, to their system. Is that a bad thing? Um, I, I don't think so, but there's going to be hearings on, I mean, look, if this is something that you're, you're passionate about and you've got, you've got uh, thoughts on this, they're not, the legislature's not trying to pull a fast one on anybody. There's going to be a ton of notice. Stakeholders like Google are going to be in the room when they're talking about this. I want other stakeholders to be in the room also, like, like you guys, um, because, um, you know, Putting Google aside, there are other apps, other de developers that don't want you to know that they're collecting your GPS data. The FTC, um, at least under the Obama administration, you know, they, reached, they, they sued and settled with Vizio for collecting geolocation information from all of the people watching TV and all of the video viewing, his, uh, the video viewing information. On the same day that they announced the settlement, they also announced that they are probably not going to be prosecuting those types of cases in the future. Because um, the acting chairwoman came in, that, the one that Trump appointed, and she made it clear that they're going to be sc scaling back. So literally, without the FTC, without the federal government, it's going to be a free-for-all in terms of what different companies can legally do. And I think that the legislature is just trying to start the conversation about how to plug some of those holes. I guess the fear that I was trying to represent is that then companies would just pull out of Illinois or just not do it. Stick with the market. Yeah. It's, it's, so, yeah, I mean, uh, there are a number of states that have state-specific laws. Um, Michigan has a law that says that you can't disclose what your customer reads, watches, or listens to without getting their consent. So companies don't disclose what people in Michigan are reading, watching, and listening to. They're still collecting it, but that's not what the law prohibits. Um, so maybe something like that would be adopted here. And, and, and if you're interested in talking about this further or with legislators, please, let's, let's talk after. Yeah. Um, is it part of the strategy right now to get a few states to pass laws to essentially make the current data sets dirty and unusable um, for these companies that have collected this data in that if California or Illinois so says you can't use our customers' data and they don't have you know, set locations for some of these things, they can't use a lot, large parts of the data set um, because it's now considered dirty data and the whole set's corrupted? If there is an overall strategy on that, that's brilliant. Um, I'm just kind of keeping track of, of, of what I'm seeing and talking to legislators about you know, these, these issues. But um, I, I just want to make this point. There's nothing inherently wrong with collecting data from people, especially, I mean, even geolocation information. Uh, I think there's a, a digital gap in what the average consumers understand versus what you know, the Silicon Valley folks are doing. Um, and they're making a lot of money off of this data. Um, when people move around with their cell phone, they're generating uh, geolocation data that's being used and sold to make a lot, a lot of money. You look at the number of employees that a company like Facebook has compared to the revenues that they're generating. I think that there's just a push right now to define who owns that type of data. Do you own the geolocation data that you generate when you walk down the street? If so, then a company can't just reach into your pocket and take it out without telling you that, that they're doing it. Yes? Uh, a lot of times we 
sign terms and terms and agreements or whatever you want to call it terms to to any kind of software you download uh if it has it the, you, whatever you're asking for in that terms in those terms and you you accepted the terms because you wanted to have the software and you had no opportunity to negotiate uh are you are you just sunk well it's not that you're sunk it's that if you actually put it into the terms, if you put into the terms what you're doing, that you're, sell, that you're co collecting this type of data, that you're selling it or sharing it with different people, even though it's buried in terms and conditions, that comes out. When Instagram a couple years ago wanted to modify their privacy policy to make changes so that they could be, start sharing data with a ton of par diff different partners, people that, whose job it is to read these these updates to the, to the privacy policies, read that, made a big deal out of it, the public made a big deal out of it, and Instagram had to dial it back and did not actually end up doing what they said they were gonna do. They reverted to their old privacy policy. So it's, I, I mean, from my perspective, um, there's nothing wrong with doing it if you're just transparent about it. It's all about giving consumers choice and leveling the playing field. I mean, this issue comes up with startup companies also. Because there's a lot of startup companies that, that we talk to that don't want to cheat on privacy. But they can't compete at the same time with the companies that are. So they're proponents of these types of laws, you know, just as much as consumers are. Does that answer your question? Sort of. I just have a sense that you signed off on the agreement. Uh, you have no ability to check no, I don't want th no. this feature. S signing off on the agreement, there's transparency there. If you choose not to read the well, agreement... You, you have to not take the service. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that? You can't take the service. Automatically, it says you, you, you can't take the service. You, you have to decline the service. Okay, right. So, okay, so, like, so I think Uber is a really good, good example here. Okay, so Uber modified their, their policies and told people that they're going to start tracking them for five minutes after they get dropped off. They're going to start collecting geolocation data for up to five minutes after they get out of the car. And a lot of people went crazy about that. It's unreasonable. They don't need it. They're just tracking us. They want more data. But my response to that was, but they're telling you that they're doing it. They're being transparent. And now, it's, now the power is back with the consumer and they can make a choice. Now they can decide with knowledge about what's going on uh, as to whether they want to continue to do, to be in business with, with Uber or, or not. I mean, Uber's a phenomenal uh, company, and I mean, just in, just, just in terms of making it easier to, <laughs> sorry, to making it in terms, making it easier to, to, to get a cab. Okay, a lot of people, like myself included, have moved to, to Yelp. There's a huge movement online about people that have moved over to Yelp. Um, but people had that choice now that Uber was forthcoming about the types of data that they were co co collecting from people. I think we have time for one last question. Sure. I uh, was wondering, so talking about um, political campaigns and the use of analytics in those, um, I was wondering, uh, so I know Cambridge Analytica also was for the worked for the Cruz campaign and for, mm -hmm. and like the Clinton and Obama campaigns also used a lot of data. Um, I was just wondering like, do you see this as something that, that does give an advantage to like one set of political values or a political party or is it just something that's like part of the landscape of how politics works now? Yeah, well, I don't know enough about what the Clinton campaign did. Um, certainly there's not as much out there as there is with Cambridge Analytica. Um, I do think that this, that using personality tests especially lends itself to a certain party. Um, <clears throat> especially when you get into things like gun rights and the really thorny issues that you need to be ex extremely careful about when crafting messages. Um, the ability to craft a different message for every person sitting in this room and to push it all out and to somehow be consistent or appear consistent is mind blowing. Um, we'll have to see what, what happens in the coming, in the, the next election cycle. But there's, there's not a lot of data out there right now about 
everything else besides that, uh, besides Cambridge and, uh, and Analytica. I'm sure that there are other platforms, but we just don't know about them yet. All right. Thank you, Ari. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me.